Welcome to Softcore History. Hello and welcome back to Softcore History. My name is Jake Goldman and I'm joined as always by our two friends, my two friends, your two friends. First one over here to my right, Rob Fox. Hello. It's always a lot of anticipation to see who gets it first. Yeah, you got it first. But that was a very Bob Ross introduction of you. Like, got my little friend here to my right. My little friend. Two got, little friends here. I got my chewy little chipmunk to my left. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Dan Register. Pointing to Rob because I was still eating. Oh, is that what's going on? Like, I don't want to talk. It's fair. We got crunchy seed bars in our teethies. Mm hmm. We should be uh, terrible comedians where we just do like bits that no one likes, but if we just do them for long enough, people will be like, oh my God, they're so funny. Like, we only do a podcast with our mouths. At all times, it's just and like, people are like they're taking comedy to weird, hilarious new places, but it's just us with, talking with our mouths full, just commenting it. Yeah, it's not yeah. funny at all. It's not even. It's not making anyone laugh at any point. But they're just like, wow, that was hilarious. They they went there. Yeah, they went there. So okay. brave. Well, we could also do the brave thing where we have a hour of stand up with no jokes. Uh, Tim Heidecker is actually doing something right now where he's just playing a very bad comedian on tour. <laughs> like he's just like a slime ball comedian. Okay, it's not. He does like name gags. <laughs> There's one clip I was watching where he's like, "Oh, your name's Jeff. Jeff the Chef. <laughs> this guy, right?" And he just keep, keeps <laughs> going to people and like doing the worst name gags you ever heard. That's I'm like, fine. that's actually pretty good. That's like, fine because yeah. there is a joke. There is an actual like funny joke in there. Yeah. But yeah, I'm just gonna like go on stage like this is my stand up special, and just like recount an hour of, of just like child abuse. <laughs> no jokes. Yeah, yeah. You know who would be great at that? Who? R. A. Dickey. Who's that? The the pitcher for the Mets, right? Yeah. The you knuckleball guy. Yeah. He got raped like eight times by like seven different people. What? In his childhood. It's, Jesus Christ. He had a really fucked up childhood. Yeah. That's well, so like men up. and women. He must have been like the best looking child ever. <laughs> Good Thanks. Lord. This is not on the Patreon. Just remember that. I know. <laughs> yeah, there's no paywall here. <laughs> yeah. But no, it, like ESPN, uh, what is their like 60 minutes thing? Yeah, yeah, 30 I, for 30 or... It's not yeah. 30 for 30, but like they used to do it's like the one E60 that, or whatever. It's one, outside yeah, the E60. lines or... No. Outside the remember, lines is, is what it was, yeah. But I think it was E60 and I remember watching it in college and just we were just like, holy shit, man. Like, like oh my God. Did R.A. Dickey... Like, was he an orphan? I don't no, it was like uh his babysitter. I know, but that's just like some random dude behind his barn. Like there's a lot of instances where I'm like, what the fuck, man? Nothing good happens behind a barn. No. <laughs> Zero. You're either putting down a dog, having sex unconsensually with someone, or yeah. getting your ass kicked. Yeah. Or murdered like that German family we did a while back. Hinterkaifeck. Yeah, yes. Yeah. They were murdered in a barn. In a barn, but you know what? Probably some stuff happened behind the barn. What's behind the, the barn door. Potentially happen in a barn. You milk a cow. You get laid, I guess. I guess, yeah, like a, ro a roll in the hay. You fuck the farmer's daughter and get shot in the face shortly afterward. Yeah. Worth it, maybe? No, probably not. A farmer's daughter? Never. You never know. Yeah. That's a fucked up country song. I fell in love with the farmer's daughter. Yeah, it's just like some fu it's fucked up of the farmer that he just lets his daughter get plowed out by this, like... I've never once paid attention to the lyrics of that this song. This rough hands, <laughs> this drifter, <laughs> this fucking rough-handed drifter comes out of the farm. All started to come back to me yeah. last night because I went uh, two-stepping. Yeah. And uh, a lot of songs I haven't heard in, like, ten years that just kind of rush back. Yeah. Fell in Love with a Farmer's Daughter is... For, and it's sung from the point of view of the farmhand who fucks his way into money. So for him, it's a joyous song. For the far <laughs> Everyone else, it's shit. The I want the song from the point of view of the farmer, which is, again, the drifter he hired uh, started spying on his daughter as he was taking baths in the creek unnecessarily. Right. Because he was provided with showering facilities. I just like so swimming in the, in the fresh water. Yeah, he was, taking, he was bathing in the creek and saw... The farmer's like hot, what he thought was hot daughter, and was like, I want to fuck her, and then accomplished his mission. But only after the farmer's daughter gets back from college and has an education and can make for herself a life somewhere that the farmer wants. He doesn't want her living on this farm. Not that he hates the life, but he wants her to go somewhere. But what happens? Have your own life, baby. Yeah. She drinks a little shine 
and the rough hand drifter fucks her literally in the back of a pickup truck. It's in the song on his own land. And eventually she <coughs> gets like, I don't know, just gets into him. And she's like, I'm staying here and you're giving your land and your daughter to this drifter. And the drifter <laughs> inherits the fucking land. That is a nightmare song. That I song mean, should be about a drifter that like, gets murdered and buried <laughs> underneath, right. like gets combined into the Beware wheat. the fury of the patient man, that <laughs> drifter. <laughs> no, the drifter, uh, the song should be about when he divorces that woman and takes half the land, too. <laughs> like, it's like, now it's just half his farm? Yeah. Oh, my God. Anyway, our story today has nothing to do with that. That's all right. It's, it's been bothering me for 12 years. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. <laughs> it's a long one, man. <laughs> it's like one day I'm going to have a podcast. Yeah, if you ever if you ever <laughs> want some good out. content, just listen to country songs and really think about them for a minute. Like that one song, is it when he cheats or before he cheats? Before he, oh, Carrie Underwood <laughs> should be in jail. <laughs> yeah. She has she has committed murder on two separate occasions <laughs> yeah. over basically one of them's just infidelity. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was a, a sketch that I wanted to do for Spare Bedroom, but none of us had the musical talent to pull it off. Right. Was a, a well, male country singer. Singing a Carrie me. Underwood, yeah. doing a Carrie Underwood cover. So he's just like <laughs> singing about killing his wife for cheating on him. Yeah. Isn't there a country song too where the guy just continues to drive by his ex girlfriend's house and he's just drinking beers in his truck? So he's drinking and driving. Yeah. And he's just like looking at her and her new boyfriend. Yeah, probably. He's I'm stalking sure. her. Voyeurism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there is, uh, oh, there is a Blake Shelton song where he catches, his, it's called, uh, Blue Tick Hound or something like that. It's like he, it's about dogs fucking, actually. Like the primary thing is about him using two dogs fucking to escape from jail. But the reason he's in jail <laughs> is because he caught his wife cheating on him and murdered both his right. wife and uh, the lover. The Shawshank. Yeah, he Shawshanked him. Yeah, and then he's like, but don't worry, I escaped. That's not don't worry territory. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> no, you should have, you should be in jail. You're a, you're it's sore, bad news that you're you got a sore out. loser. Yeah. Yeah. You shouldn't have gotten out. Yeah. And the, the song ends with the line, love got me in here and love got me out. Because the two dogs were fucking. Yeah. They got him out. But but no, love didn't. If You murdered your wife. That's no, there's no love there. Murder the guy, I guess, but. Or don't murder. How about don't murder? Yeah. Still better than any Luke Bryan song. Country Girl Shake It For Me. I actually love that song. Sorority Girl. God. Okay. My, my, my little lady. Right, whatever. Just yeah, that was that was a very common AD announcing guy. song. Yeah. Anyway, we're not talking about any of that today. We are talking about something even more southern, Antarctica. Oh, okay. The most southern place on earth, some would say. Until the poles reverse. Yeah. Well, eventually. It'd be funny if the poles reversing actually just meant the planet was like. <laughs> it's just <flipped. laughs> it's just like ah! You know, in space, doggy style and reverse cowgirl are the same position. Sick. Yeah, if you think about it. There's no axis. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, actually, if the poles reverse, that would make, like, Michigan more southern than Georgia. Well, yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. Well, a lot of people don't know this, but did you know Detroit is more eastern than Atlanta? Is it really? hmm Really? Detroit is more eastern than Atlanta. Yeah, it's also north of Windsor, Canada. Yeah. Yeah, the closest but, country, if you travel south, the closest country to Detroit is Canada. Yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, we're talking about Antarctica, though. Well, hold on. Let's get back to Detroit geography for a second. <laughs> okay, fine. Let's just touch. We got six pages of Antarctica. <laughs> but, uh, nah, it's fine. Okay. Uh, we're going to be talking about this guy, Douglas Mawson. He is probably the toughest nerd to ever exist. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. I think the toughest nerd is anyone who shoots up a school. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, dude. <laughs> no. Does that make them tough, though? <laughs> no, not at all. No, it doesn't. It makes them <laughs> no, a loser. No tougher than Blake Shelton shooting now, his naked wife. I don't, if anyone went into a school with, like, a, you know, katana sword, we we have an argument for that. <laughs> Better, I guess. Yeah. But a high school. It's got to be his peers, you know what I mean? Like, Jer- Yeah, you can't go into, like, a... No, we're not getting into this. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not getting into God, the semantics. Jake, your episodes always get so awful. I don't know why. Yeah. It's like I'm getting derailed. <laughs> School shootings, all right, Dickie getting raped eight times. Yeah, it's like I just, I was asking for it, 
in this episode. You really were. Yeah, anyway. I just, like, I'm out of fucks to give. I hate my life right now. It's on Sundays, yeah. <laughs> Our Sunday episodes get real loose. Well, we're all hungover, probably. A little hungover. I'm not, I can't even live at my house right now. And I said, at least I was on the Patreon earlier, my baby's been a dick. It's just, it's a lot. I was subjected to four hours of line dancing. You enjoyed every minute of I it. Did. Yeah. I didn't. What did kind of you, sex did you have at the end? Hey. E. Did you go back and have like some cool like line dancing sex? No comment. Okay. Oh, that means he did it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Douglas Mawson was born on the 5th of May, 1980, or not 1982, sorry, 1882 in England, and his family emigrated to Australia when he was five and settled just outside of Sydney. Smart, moving closer to Antarctica. Yes. Smart. That's a good start. Yeah. Already a brilliant kid. Yes. Yeah. I mean, by no choice of his own did he end now, up Now, what year is this? 1882. And so he moves there in 1887. So the Nazi bases aren't there yet. No. The Nazi bases are not in Antarctica. Presumably the lizards yet. still live underneath it, but... Uh, either I think the lizards have the South Pole and the mole people have the North Pole. Yeah. Oh, no, there are alien bases as well. They kind of cut... The saucers come out from underneath mm-hmm. the ice caps. Everyone knows this. Yeah. Yeah. We watched Above Majestic together. Right. Yeah. You learned that then. Washington, D.C. is the capital Somebody of the United States. Somebody actually suggested that for saying the, uh, stuff everyone knows. The Patreon is that we watch Beyond Majestic together. <laughs> that might be worth it, honestly. I'm down. Yeah. I don't know anything about I'll dro- that. I'll drop the next three bucks for the next watch along for Beyond Majestic, and we'll spend two and a half hours watching about lizard people conspiracies. <laughs> Whatever. It's not really this podcast, but yeah. You know. Yeah, it's a terrible documentary with Photoshop all over it. But uh, So he attended the University of Sydney, where he graduated in 1902 with a Bachelor of Engineering degree. By 1903, a year later, he's about 21 years old now, he was already publishing papers on a variety of topics, including the geology of Melanesia. Or Melanesia. He then became a lecturer in petrology and mineralogy at the University of Adelaide. In 1905, he also identified and first described the mineral Davidite. All this to say, he's big old dork for rocks. Okay. Guy fucking loves rocks, man. Hey, I'll tell you what, dude. In terms of, like, modern jobs, there are few sciences you can go into, I feel like, that are more of a guaranteed moneymaker than geology. Actually, that's true. You can scout for oil. You can look for minerals, lithium, things like that. Just get your rocks off. Get his rocks off. There you go, Dan. Dan's got one on the board. One for Dan. He he counted it. No, that's two because the R.A. Dickey one. Uh yeah, so that was a real zing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because of his fast-growing reputation as a geologist, Mawson was invited to join Ernest Shackleton's Nimrod expedition to Antarctica in 1907. He originally intended to stay for just the summer. With the So basically how the Antarctic trips would work is they'd be about two years. Mm-hmm. So a uh, ship would come down in the summer. So in Antarctica, that's around, I think, like October to probably March. It's Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, yeah so they come as, down around like October. Like the Australian Open is in the dead of summer. Yeah. People don't know that, but, like, when they're playing the Australian Open, it's, like, 110 degrees there. It's fucking yeah. awful. Yeah, people do January. Do they do that? What? Why do they do that? I don't know. They should have it now. Like, it should be in, like, right. fucking July. Like, Dead of winter? Yeah, because it's still, like, nice there. It's, like, 75 degrees or some shit. Yeah. But they do it when it's just hell on Earth. So, yeah, what they do is they send a ship down to Antarctica... And they would like the ship would chill for a little bit while they unloaded supplies and they do some readings. And then, like, a bunch of people would go back with the ship and then the explorers would stay there and they'd send a ship again when the like mm-hmm. winter was over. Like, hope or, you live. Or at the end of summer. Yeah. Um, Good luck. So, he originally intended to stay for the summer, but instead, uh, both he and his mentor, Edgeworth David, stayed an extra year to join the expedition to find the magnetic South Pole or to reach it. They knew where it was by, right. by compass. Right. No one had ever been there. Yeah, just for some details on this expedition, uh, the journey was 1,260 miles long. The temperature was around minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit at any given time. So this is the summer in cool. Antarctica. And there was one point they had to climb 7,000 feet, and they were manhauling their supplies, so they weren't using dogs for this trip, hmm. which seems fucking stupid. Seems but terrible. I imagine there's a reason for it. I didn't get into that. but Would you – I feel like I might – Too cold for dogs? No, yeah. it's not too cold for dogs. I it's think it's not ter- too cold for people. It's not too cold for. I dogs. think the problem is that at one point they have to get all the supplies up a seven thousand foot elevation. Yeah, and the dogs they can't do can't that. Do it. Yeah, I dude, I think it might freak me out a little bit to reach magnetic south, in particular, just because it's like, oh, I'm on the bottom of Earth. Same with the top. Mm. Feel- I'd rather be on the top than the bottom. Yeah, because you can't fall off. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's just stop? I know, I know exactly what's stopping me from going bloop. Feels like I could just go bloop. Yeah, that's true. 
It's kind of like if you're really far north, you're like, is the sky thinner here? Yeah. If I shot something up in the air, would it go to space faster? And in theory, it would. I ain't looking down, but I don't see nobody above me. So in doing this journey, they became in the company of, well, they were, it was Edgeworth, um, Mawson, and this other guy, Alistair McKay. They became the first people to climb the summit of Mount Erebus and to trek to the south magnetic pole, or so they thought. So they thought they did it. Okay. Uh, turns out they were about 100 miles away from it. So they oh, were like- Just missed. Yeah, they were like out of, think about it. They went 1,260 miles. They, they were 100 miles away. Imagine they doing all that and then going home and being- recalculate and be like, oh, actually, you know, I fucked it up. So, we uh, goofed. yeah, Mawson was already like, kind of like, well, I want to go on this expedition because it's like a once in a lifetime thing. But he realized like, okay, I don't really care about the magnetic South Pole. I care more about like understanding the weather and geology of Antarctica. Right. Antarctica. God, it's so hard for me to say that. Uh, but he goes back to Australia and he's like doing more geology work and you stuff. You know what Antarctica means? Not Arctica. Kind of. Yeah, and and I imagine is the antithesis to ants, Arctica, like yeah. not Arctica. Yes, Arctic is north. But do you know what Arctica means? Iceland. I don't know. No, what. Antarctica means no bears. Arctica means bears. Yeah, oh, there's bears there. Bearland, not bearland. Yeah, shouldn't just be penguin land. That's right. where the penguins live. Exactly. Yeah, I think North Pole should be Ant Penguina, <laughs> and not pen- penguin and land. Penguina. Yeah. And Pangina. That's dumb. There's no penguins in the North Pole? No. Mm-hmm. They're all South Pole. Yep. They're all South. Yeah. And Africa. Yeah, well, and parts South of America. Chile. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so people continue to go to Antarctica, Antarctica because, <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's getting in your Just head. say yeah. Snow Island. Yeah. <laughs> they, they keep going south down to that hell hole, that white hell down there, mm-hmm. uh, because they realize, oh, shit, they didn't actually make it. And Mawson is invited to go on Robert Scott's Terra Nova expedition in 1910. The goal of this expedition, of course, is to become the true first expedition to reach the magnetic South Pole. For, only for bragging rights. Yeah, it's solely for bragging rights. Right. Instead of being caught up with the pomp and fame of being the first to reach it, Mawson thinks that that is a little too jockey for him to go back and try to do it again. He turns down the opportunity but gets to thinking that there's better reasons to go back, like weather and rocks. He decides to charter his own expedition, the Australasian Antarctic expedition. This would send him and his men to the coast of Antarctica, directly south of Australia, an area that was pretty widely unexplored. So people had only come down to like the shore of here and be like, we were here. Right. And they leave because they're like, fuck that. Well, there's only a certain spot that people hang out at now in Antarctica, really. And it's by South America. Yeah. It's an easy camp, right? Yeah. There's like, I think there's like five people that live there a year. No. It depends. It's a pretty big like, well, town. Well, there's there's like native people that live there, right? No. In no, Antarctica? It's no. It's all just like scientists. Oh, uh, okay. And there's cooks and stuff. There's like a thousand people. There's, there's a, 15, Oh, yeah. There's a post office there's there. There's like 1,500 people. It yeah. appears there is a station on an island just off the coast of Antarctica, uh, directly south of Australia, called uh, Dumont de Urville Station. But, uh, yeah. I mean, it's not, man. I don't know if that's the one Bourdain went to. But he did an episode in Antarctica. Would you go to Antarctica? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think I would too. I, I, just to say, I did it. It's freaking grim. I but. feel like maybe for like three days. I worked with a guy actually at a couple jobs ago that would go to Antarctica, like for he, I guess he was a scientist too. He's like a data engineer or something like that. Sick. Yeah, it's like that's crazy, man. But it's a short prep cook. How do you end up there? <laughs> like, it's just like I wanted to ask him. He's like, yeah, it's kind of a long story. I was like, okay. I wanted to hear it. I'd rather do that than work. That but. would be sick, though, if you went and became, like, a dishwasher in Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, you're, like, the guy on the spaceship that there. got brought up because, like, man, he's a great space cook. He's a great cook for Antarctica. Just washes the fuck out of dishes. Yeah, he can turn off the steam valve. Like, your muscle, essentially. If yeah, you but you're the there. first one they let die. Yeah, I've seen the thing. Yeah. That's probably why I like the yeah, Antarctica stories. you know stories. where the supplies are. You know where the food is. You stash your own stuff. Yeah. It's like, oh, we're down to five rations. Really, it's seven, but no one knows that. Uh, Mawson's plan was to have a ship drop his men off on the coast where they would build a hut. From there, they would branch out into teams, each going a different direction. After a couple of months, they would turn around and go back to the hut and compile all the data they gathered on, like, the weather and the geology and rocks and stuff like that that they found while waiting for the ship to come back and pick them up. Uh, It was the Aurora that would drop them off there. 
and it all worked out in the end, and everything was fine. They did it. Okay. The end. The end. Just kidding. Hooray. It was a frigid hellscape of bad luck and misfortune for everyone there. <laughs> uh, so after sailing across the Southern Ocean, the Australasian party anchored in Commonwealth Bay, an especially remote part of the Antarctic coast, in January 1912. Over the next few months, wind speeds in the coast averaged between 50 miles an hour and sometimes topped at 200 miles an hour, and blizzards were almost always constant. Mawson's plan was to split his expedition into four groups, one to man base camp, and the other three to head into the interior to do the scientific work. He nominated himself to lead what was known as the Far Eastern Shore Party, a three-man team assigned to survey several glaciers hundreds of miles from the base. It was an especially risky assignment, and uh, Mawson and his men would have the furthest to travel, and hence the heaviest loads to carry. Do you think the Far East Movement was named after him? Far East Movement? Possibly. Like a G6? Like a G6, yes. Man, I'm so glad that band is not a thing anymore. That was their only song, wasn't it? I'd imagine. Yeah, I, that song sucked. That was, like, the way people point to, um, like, used to point to, like, Safety Dance being, a, like, the peak, like, peak awful 80s. Safety Dance, dance, dance slaps. To, yeah. Uh, friends behind People will point to LMFAO as peak awful 2010s. I would say <sighs> Party Rock. That's pretty bad. It's awful. The Kia Hamster song. That's why I remember Party Rock from. They're not the worst of the group. Who's the worst? Who do you think it is? It might be Far East Movement. Yeah, It could be. <laughs> really could be Far East Movement. These guys, Far Eastern Shore Party, way cooler than Far East Movement. Okay. Unfortunately, they did not have a G6. They could have used one. Actually, I don't know if you can fly G6 around Antarctica. You can fly anything over Antarctica. I don't know, man. Weather could get bad. Fly higher. I don't know. <laughs> so how does it work when you fly over Antarctica? You just fly over it. You start flying north again. You just ra- go back around? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you actually appear on the I north. Don't you, actually, the Earth works. you go through a portal and you end up in the North Pole. It's a wormhole. <laughs> yeah. You ever seen Pac-Man? Yeah. You go to the bottom of the screen, and you pop you out at the up. top. Yeah. Flights go over the North Pole all the time. It's actually a lot easier to fly that way. You, yeah. You split your distance. Oh, yeah. You're, you're, Cuts it in fucking yeah. half. It's way easier to fly up and then back down than it is to well, fly across. the other side of Antarctica? Antarctica. Like when you're over it. Okay, so say you're coming down from Australia, then you would hit Chile. Okay. Because it's, a you know, a globe, Dan. I, yeah. Just so if you out. wanted to fly from Sydney to Buenos Aires... You would pro- the best way to go, presumably, would be over, over Antarctica. Antarctica. Okay, it might be the fastest. I don't know if the weather is that good or not. But yeah, like you yeah. Would, there's probably I think there's a, sh- a Gulf Stream or something of the sort around Antarctica because the, the sea is. is really rough around it. There's like a no, a there circular, is like a circular that keeps the Earth cool actually. Yeah, so I I won't get into all the geology of it because I don't. Please do. Yeah, I don't know. Soft core geology. Yeah, coming I'd prefer out. if you did. I don't know it. So, boss, like I said. uh, it was a three-man team assigned to survey several glaciers hundreds of miles from the base. It was an especially risky assignment. Moss and his men have the furthest to travel and hence the heaviest loads to carry. And they would have to cross an area pitted with deep crevasses. Not a crevice, a crevasse. Okay. Each concealed by snow. Moss and his crew departed the Commonwealth Bay on November 10th, 1912. I'm guessing after the first crews go and come back, like they're the last to yeah. go. I'd um, also imagine like act, the actual heaviest loads because they probably weren't jerking off. Why do you think they weren't jerking off? Too cold. Do you think it would freeze right out of their, like, shooting pellets? I mean, not... there is a temperature where that would happen. <laughs> yeah, they're, in, so they're in, like, a tent, right? Yeah, they're in a hut. They're in an insulated hut. Yeah, they're not jerking off. Mm. Yeah. So, uh... Ma- maybe just a quiet rub. Right? Just, you just like, rub the just head. like, slowly oozes quietly, out, maybe. Yeah, and then just, yeah. you know, snap it off. You're gonna have to, dude, you, well, you're gonna have to do it in your pants, for sure. Like, you obviously can't whip it out and go. Well, doing it in your pants comes up in this. Sick. So would it be like sub zero though? As soon as it comes out, it just freezes. Mm, it's there's too much salt. It wouldn't not. It wouldn't freeze the same way just like water would. Oh, well, it's unfortunate. It's something we can think about during the episode, guys. Okay. While you're listening, just think of what would happen in that situation. Yeah. So uh, Mawson has to select Heavy loads. His- we need to rent a walk-in freezer. <laughs> just try it out. Crank yeah. it down to minus ten. Mawson selects two companions way, to join him. Way colder. I just said the average temp was minus ten. I know. Seems colder. So, the two companions. The first one is Lieutenant Belgrave Ninnis, a British Army officer. He was the expedition's dog handler, so I'm guessing Moss and realized that dogs could actually be a really nice thing to have in Antarctica when right. you're trying to venture hundreds Plus of miles. Plus, if they're pulling your sled, they'll fall down the crevasse before you will. They'll you take just, you with you. Though. Huh. You just jump off the sled. It's fine. You may think that. <laughs> 
Ninnis' close friend, Xavier Mertz, was the other person. He was a 28-year-old Swiss lawyer whose chief qualifications for the trek were his idiosyncratic English, which was amusing to the other two. And what? His, he was there to tell jokes? <laughs> just to sound funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even tell jokes. Yeah. His high spirits, because he's, I guess, you know, basically just a uh, every, Swiss guy. Every fucking trip into the mouth of winter hell needs a uh, goofball. You need, you need a half-yodeling Swiss man. Yeah. Yeah. And then... uh he was a stand. Things light. He was a standing champion cross country skier. So oh, that's actually quite. They useful. got a bro with an accent and a sports trophy, basically. I mean, cross country skiing seems super useful in Antarctica. Oh, uh, you'd think that, but they didn't go cross country skiing. Fair. They were on sleds. Is it flat? Cross country skiing? No. Antarctica. No. Yeah. It's I mean, parts. It's some it's parts. a mountainous. Is it mostly flat. There's a lot of flat. There's a lot of mountains. It just depends on where you are. Mm. There's there's really high mountains and plateaus and things like that. There's it's high just glaciers. Just off. Right. I mean, that's what everyone thinks of. Yeah, I would think Hoth is probably a fair estimate. Hoth isn't the name of the planet, by the way. What's a part? It's the station? It's the system. Oh. The hot, they're in the Hoth system. What's the name of the planet? I don't know, but presumably the Hoth system would be named after the star. Shut up, nerd. <laughs> the uh, explorers took three sledges, uh, pulled by a total of 16 huskies, and loaded with a combined 1,720 pounds of food, survival gear, and scientific oh. instruments. I feel like we're setting up for maybe the worst thing we've said on the podcast. What? Dead dogs. Yeah. They're going to eat so many dogs. They're going to eat all the dogs. Making good time, the team travels 300 miles in just over a month. Almost everything was going according to plan. The three men reduced their load as they ate their way through their supplies, and only a couple of sick dogs had hindered their progress. (laughs) I guess they were jerking off. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They were reducing their load, all right, because they're eating the food weight. Also, you know where... uh, no matter how cold it is, where your fucking jizz won't freeze. The sun. No, I was going to say inside of a dog. God, dude. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why are you saying this? It's weird, though, because one dog was pregnant. What? Think, one dog yeah. was pregnant, yeah. Makes you think. Oh, boy. <laughs> However, a series of eerie incidents. So, forced- wait, hold on. How, how much dog veal was consumed on this trip? We'll get to that. Man. What? <laughs> oh, man. This is... I can't deal with eating puppies right now. Yeah. I'd rather so let's fuck just get back to R.A. Dickey. <laughs> no, 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 no. This can of worms has been open. However, a series of eerie incidents foreshadowed what would soon come. First, Mawson had a strange dream one night about his father being in poor health. Mawson had left his parents in good health, but the dream occurred. Wow, how eerie. <laughs> yeah. Well, it can't be right. But the dream occurred. When it occurred, he would later realize it was shortly after his father had unexpectedly fallen sick and died. So he had a dream about a day after his father died, about his father falling sick and dying. Uh, And this is all from his notes. Like, he kept a very well-logged diary. Then the explorers found one husky, which had been pregnant. No one knows how it got pregnant. Yeah, probably another dog. (laughs) Yeah, probably another dog. But who knows with these guys, huh? You never know. I'm just saying their semen wouldn't freeze inside of a dog. Okay. (laughs) I shouldn't have brought it back up. I also don't think it would get the dog pregnant though it, it no. wouldn't but i'm just saying like what i is me saying a sign if me saying a scientific fact makes you upset then i think you need to self-examine you know what i mean yeah, trust the science that's on you trust the science trust for sure the science so they, oh does science bother you that sounds like a you problem they found Tom doesn't freeze inside of a dog <laughs> it's facts <laughs> they found <laughs> The pregnant dog devouring her own puppies. Oh, that happens all the time. Yeah, this was normal for dogs in such extreme conditions, but it unsettled the men, doubly so when far inland. I mean, yeah, I assume they were like, they took it as a bad sign. Yeah, it's like, that's probably not good. Yeah. It's like a sailor's omen, you know, like, oh, Oh, you know what the omen is? You are in the worst place on earth, and you should have already known that. Yeah, it's like, this is very inhospitable. That's where omens are. You don't have an omen at, like, fucking (laughs) H-E-B. Oh, no, the food is... Almost out of date. Like, right. yeah. If you had an omen at H E B, that one woman wouldn't have gotten her throat slit in the parking lot of that. Well, that H-E-B. was in the parking lot of the H E B, not at H E B. Yeah, true. But she would have had that omen. I guess someone walking in their car after that had happened is like, oh god, there's yeah. a dead woman. My omen would have been that I was at the Congress Old Torf H E B. It's like I'm here at three yeah. a.m. Is that essentially the uh, murder Kroger of H E Bs? Yes, that is. A, it was it's the crime H E B. It made no sense. It's in, like, one of the most expensive parts of town, technically. Well, when that report came out, it wasn't quite yet there. It wasn't quite that expensive. I don't think I, at any point of living in Austin, could have afforded a house there. Probably not. I couldn't have. Uh, So, 
I guess another thing that happened was a bird smashed into the side of Ninnis's sledge, uh, and they had no idea where the bird came from. They're like, "There's no birds around." This bird just like slammed right. into his like you wormhole. Know. Yeah, wormhole. Just like the Summerton man. Wormholes explain everything, really. Uh, Haven't they opened up like uh, two or three wormholes since like 2014 or something in Switzerland? What in, in, in the Hadron in, Collider in CERN? Like at the CERN. Collider? They have. S- no, they've created like mini big bangs or something. Small black holes, mini big bangs. So, yeah, 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 yeah. By slamming shit into each yeah, other. Yeah, they're accelerating particles into each other and then seeing what mini particles come off. And they started that in like 2014. They right? started it in 2012. Oh, did they? That mm-hmm. is, would be fucked up to think like CERN just has like a mini universe inside of their facility. Or it's altering our timeline. Yeah, that's kind of the theory I've heard is that all the crazy shit that's happened lately is because different timeline. We've While we keep hopping through timelines mm-hmm. and just not noticing. Yeah. Cool. That changes nothing for me. Anyway, now a series of near disasters made the men begin to feel that their luck must be running out. Three times, Ninnis almost plunged into concealed cracks in the ice. Mawson was suffering from a split lip from another sledging accident that sent shafts of pain shooting across the left side of his face. On the evening of December 13th, 1912, the three explorers pitched camp in the middle of yet another glacier. Mawson abandoned one of their three sledges and redistributed the load on the two others. Mm. (laughs) I'm waiting for it. I got nothing. Yeah, you already said pitch the tent, so. Yeah. (laughs) This guy, this guy, man. Yeah, I guess I didn't catch all this, but he pitched camp. He didn't pitch a tent. Well, he Uh, pitched tent. I mean, he did pitch tents. So the reason why he did this was he was redistributing, he was redistributing the weight of the travel caravan in order to make it lighter. Uh, So one of the sledges would carry rocks, the other one would carry food. This way they could consolidate their weight and make better time. Then the men slept fitfully, disturbed by distant booms and cracking deep below them. Mawson and Ninnis did not know what to make of the noises, but they frightened the ski bully Mertz. I call him a ski bully because he's just a cross-country skier. Okay. I just imagine like a... 80s, like, better off dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Suck it, Darsh, but, like, Swiss. <laughs> That's downhill, though. They were downhill skiers, you're correct. Yeah, cro- cross-country skiers, different breeds. It is the nerdiest of skiing. It is, su- oh, man, if you, if I don't understand, like, I don't understand why anyone would be into it, to be quite Anything honest. Anything with cross-country in the name. You want to run for a while? I know. Whenever I would see the kid, like, I remember freshman year of high school, you know, like, people wanted to play football and soccer and stuff like that. And I'm talking about like fall sports in particular and winter sports and basketball. But then you would see, and those sports didn't have to recruit like from the student base, right? Like people want to try out for those, but man, watching like the wrestling coach and the cross country coach and shit recruit people. And then I, and then I would see them doing it cross country in particular. And I'd be like, you got tricked into that, huh? That's how I felt kids. about wrestling. Yeah, they I did get, feel I did feel that way about wrestling as well. Yeah, I just remember seeing my friends that wrestled. They were in really good shape and stuff, but like it's like, man, your ear is fucked, dude. Yeah, what yeah, is wrong? Awesome. Oh man, you get so much ringworm and no chicks. Yeah, sick. I I mean, I remember I my freshman religion class was with the freshman wrestling coach, and he was making like making his pitch one day in class. Like he's like, hey, for just five minutes, real quick, I just want to talk about, uh, you know, maybe why you should think about trying out for wrestling, and like. He was like, if you already play football, it's great for, like, being on the line and stuff like that, which it is, and yeah. all that stuff. But, like, I was just like, I was never going to be a wrestler anyway, but I was just like, this sounds horrible. Yeah. Not as bad as cross country, but still horrible. Yep. What do you think kids that ran, con- like, cross country in high school are doing now? Still running, man. <sighs> who cares? And they're demons? Yeah. Once again, who cares? It was no one of, like, note you know what I mean? Like Usually it, the most forgettable people in high school. Yes, right? literally. So uh, Mertz actually had a long experience of cross-country skiing, obviously, over frozen snowfields. And he uh, told them, like, hey, all the warmer air has made the ground ahead of us unstable. He told them directly, the snow masses must be collapsing in their arches. And wrote in his diary that the sound was like the distant thunder of a cannon. So apparently being a Swiss cross-country skier made him really adept at knowing that the ground wasn't good. And He's like literally you, his whole hobby is traveling across frozen land. Yeah. But you think like the geologist would at least know, like, hey, the guy that's been to Antarctica before. Yeah, this guy's just a rock nerd. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't fucking know anything. So it's like trying to cross a frozen lake. He, this is the, yeah, this is yeah. the scientist who sees a dog eating his puppies and is like, it must be the devil. <laughs> it's fair. 
totally fair. I mean, this is also 1912. So, okay. yeah. But anyway, the next day dawned, and it was a beautiful 11 degrees below freezing. A warm day by Antarctic standards. Wait, when was the Titanic? 12. Hmm. March, I think. April. Or this, I think this, April. This is after that. Okay, I was going to say. When is it? put on Antarctica. Oh, yes. Yeah, so this is late 1912. This is late 1912, yeah. Okay. Maybe they caused something to break off. Float all the way up. <laughs> yeah. Float around Australia. I'm just trying to connect dots. Yeah, that's fair. You're just asking, asking questions. questions. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, car- the party continued to make good time, and at noon, Mawson halted briefly to shoot the sun in order to determine their position. So I guess he was, like, mapping where they were with yeah. the coordinate oh, of the he sun. he wasn't just firing into the sky. You no, pop a couple like, shots off of the, the sun. The sun yells you, hey, you're here. Because, like hey. The, it's the baby from Teletubbies. Stop shooting at it me. It starts giggling when, you know, when you're there. It's like, are we here? And it's like, <laughs> and you're like, oh, we're here, yeah. That would make me want to pop off some rounds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he was standing on the runners of his moving sledge, completing his calculations when he became aware that Mertz, who was skiing ahead of the sledges, had stopped singing his Swiss student songs and had raised one ski pole in the air to signal that he had encountered a crevasse. Mawson called back to warn Ninnis. Crevasse? Crevasse. Why? What's, why is it different than crevice? Okay. A crevice is in the ground, crevasse is in the ice. Oh. Yeah. <sighs> Bad. That's I hate those semantics. Yeah, that's the difference. Yeah, yeah. It's so uppity. It's a. It's a. Actually, it's called a crevasse. It's a crevasse. <laughs> that's definitely come out of someone's mouth right that's after the word actually. Dick. Yeah. Uh, Mawson called back to warn Ninnis before returning to his calculations. It was only several minutes later that he noticed that Mertz had halted again and was looking back in alarm. Twisting around, Mawson realized that Ninnis and his sledge and dogs had vanished. Ninnis, who happened to be walking beside the rear sled and not on the railings of his sledge, had fallen through a hole in the ice and down a crevasse to his death. Oh, no. He died by a crevasse. The most pretentious way to die. His fall broke the snow crust, which caused the rear sled to also fall through the ice, crashing 150 feet below. Killing all the dogs. Snow crust? This is the very... Why is that funny? Why is snow crust funny? Tell me, Jake. I can't. I can't. It's That's like what? dried cum. Is that what it is? Is that what you're getting at? Maybe. Or is that like a, a cokey booger? That would work, too. Yeah. S- yeah. Snow crust? Yeah. That's actually the actually word. You wake next up the day. next day, and you're like, mm. yeah. you're like ah! gross. Oh, oh I, didn't want to, I didn't want to feel this way this morning. Unfortunately, this Here's is the a dog. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> just what? Pick your nose and eat it? <laughs> yeah, just do a gummy with your boogers. <laughs> Book <and gummy. laughs> Book, that, that's how you know you have a problem. Yeah. If you're picking your nose for the cocaine remnants. Yeah. Oh, I guess God. if the only way it's worse is like your friend ODs and you're just picking their nose. You're like, I need to get the, get the rest out. Oh, my God. You can't waste any. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or your friend. God, never mind. This is the very sled, unfortunately, that held the food that was strategically left in the rear to be out of the line of danger for the party ahead if they encountered crevasses. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Again, you he just a, liked rocks. Yeah, you can't have a rock sled and a food sled. Yeah, even worse, this was the only uh, sledge with a uh, tent. Yeah. Oh, it. wow. Yeah. So they, they have a tent. And plus that fucking pregnant dog ate all its puppies, so there's just no food. So they have dogs. Still, they have a handful of dogs. Playing dogs to cook. Perfect. Yeah. They have a ton of rocks. So Mawson's pumped. They didn't lose the rocks. Yeah. He's he, not really he's pumped. He's got what he wants. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they are pretty much fucked. So Mawson and Mertz are now minimum four week sled trek from their hut. They have about a week worth of food on their person. They still had food on the other sledge, but like the majority of it was on. Right. Again, I feel one. like you should distribute that evenly. Not like yeah. rationally for speed, yeah. but like. No, I like having a rock cart. <laughs> what we got on this one? Left. We got rocks. Can you eat rocks? I mean, you can. You can eat them. Would you gain any nutritional value from eating No, rocks? not at all. You would feel full. It's like uh, there were. There's been many a sailor lost at sea. I know they store a ton of stories from World War II, but I assume this has happened to pretty much constantly throughout history. Is they'll just be like, no, I think I can drink the seawater. It, it happens to everybody. It's yeah, like, a, like no, dude, I think it's. I think it's working. Like I think my body's. 
do them. Why can dolphins do it? Why can dolphins do it? When you're severely dehydrated and losing your mind, yeah. you start, you're like, well, I'm in water. Right. There's yeah. people I know that drink s- like solely salt water. No, they don't. They put salt in their water. But they don't drink actual salt water. Yeah, like they don't drink stuff with the salination content. What's the difference, I guess? A lot of salt. Hmm. So much salt. Well, you put just a little sprinkle of salt and you get those electrolytes? I guess that's it. That's I've, fine, I yeah. It's like, like table salt. Yeah, it's probably iodized or something, too. Yeah. Also, it's like in, in like um, in like the Adriatic and stuff, people in Italy, people will take seawater and make pasta with it. Ooh. Yeah. Oh. Like you, that actually you, sounds delightful. You salt... Do you salt the water before you cook pasta? Of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Olive oil and There you salt. go. Imagine like some really punchy. Gotta, yeah, so it's not sticky. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oil. And it gives the noodles a nice flavor. Yeah. You know what I saw uh, yesterday on Instagram that I like really want to try? I don't I, th- I don't know where I could possibly get it. I think it was in Italy or something like that. It was just like some fair food, but it was in like not America, I think, where they just uh, deep fried an entire squid. Ooh. That's an alien. Yeah. I mean, you're you're eating an intelligent life form. Yeah, but it's just a, a big stick of calamari. <laughs> it's just the biggest. Dude, I'm all about that. Is it the full, you, you can see the squid, right? Oh, yeah, no, it's it's a squid. Like, squid they take shape. a whole dead squid. Maybe they de-beak it. I don't know. And then they bread Gotta it. keep the beak. Yeah, well, that, well, fine. They bread it and everything. Do squids have beaks or is that octopi? I think they both, both. do. So when the deep is getting sucked on by an octopus. Yeah. Is he getting beaked out? It yeah. depends, you know. Maybe the octopi or the. the it's being gentle. Could, you know, it's like a girl giving a blowjob. She, <laughs> yeah, she's got teeth. She's got teeth. I don't think octopi have lips, though. They got a mouth, don't they? Okay, so uh, yeah, they knew they needed to get back to the hut, the main base camp hut, essentially. Oh uh, yeah, well, they they are down a dude. They have no food. They're like, fuck. It's gonna take four weeks. We have one week of food. We got a ration. The first stage of the return journey was a mad dash to the spot where they had camped the previous night. There, he and Mertz recovered the sledge they had abandoned when they had right. reduced everything down to two. And Mawson used his pocket knife to hack its runners into poles for some spare canvas. Now, they had shelter, but there was still the matter of deciding how to attempt the return journey. They left no food depots on their way, depots on their way out. Their choices were to head for the sea a route that was longer but offered the chances of seals to eat and the slim possibility that they might sight the expedition's supply ship or to go back the way they'd come. Mawson selected going this way in the way they came. They, they wanted to go the way they came. Okay. Yeah. They didn't want to you know. eat some delicious seal? Well, you'd have to hunt the seal when you're already de- Exhausted. Depleted. And it's a yeah. longer journey. So they're thinking we can probably we made it here we can make Although it back. Although it's not hard to club a seal, right? Right. I think you. I think I've it's seen m- videos. much easier to take the the coastal route, personally. I think Even in bad weather, you know, oh, well, there's water. And it's more mild, too. Yeah. You're not as intense winds going across, like, unblocked swaths of flatland. you get a decent view when you die. Yeah. Yeah. I would have gone, 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 gone to the sea. Uh, he and Mertz realized, though, that they wouldn't have enough food for even the way back. So they killed the weakest of their remaining dogs and rationed out what they could of its stringy flesh and liver and fed, like, the leftover stuff, like the scraps, to other huskies mm. to feed them. Wonderful. Yeah. How do you think they picked those out? The weakest ones? Yeah. Bench con- push-up contest. Yeah. They're like, all right, boys. Doing Who can tell what the... Idea. Yeah. Well, they actually, they put, uh, they put them all in a field, fenced it off, and had them fight it out. And there was a river yeah. behind one of the fences. Yes. Yeah, it was one of the borders. You, if, if you get that, you'll understand you that joke it. later. Yeah, you until get the joke Wednesday. Later. Yeah. Uh, For the first few days, they made good time, but Mawson soon went snow blind. The pain was agonizing, and Mertz actually. What What is snow blind? um, I actually don't. I think it's when your eyes start to freeze. That's cool. I'm going to look it up. Or maybe like the light reflecting off the snow starts to sear your eyeballs. Because you should wear UV protection when you're in snow, it sends light directly into your eyes. So snow blindness, it's a form of photokeratitis right. caused by UV rays reflected off the ice in the snow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, so it just, this. yeah, it fucking fries your I mean, eyes. Jake just literally just said that. Yeah. yeah. So or Mer- he said it was either freezing or, or that. the UV. It's the UV. Okay. So uh, Mertz actually uh, dumbass. result like he had to bathe Mawson's eyes with a solution of zinc sulfate and cocaine. So that was the treatment Red for snow. Coke on- 
it, that's for snow blindness in 1912 was uh, zinc and coke. What they need food for? They had cocaine. Yeah. It's like <laughs> you should have just been down in that, yeah. right? Like you, that's zinc. Use it for your eyes. <laughs> just snort well, that pick shit. Pick me up, you know. Well, it's just a uh, you know you're doing a, a ready. Yeah, they're in your retina. Yeah. I mean, it's also kind of interesting. They were going for like 27 hours at a time to to try and make it as fast All right, time so as possible. Cocaine. Oh, yeah, just drank a little cocaine solution they eventually had to slow down though they ended up getting into a whiteout so bad that it kills two of the huskies that they have and it forces the men to heart like harness themselves to the sled to continue because they keep falling off because it's just they don't they can't like see where right. they're going they're totally at a certain point you abandon the sled do you walking sounds better once the dogs are dead yeah it's a uh, it's an interesting thought dan because i wonder like when all the dogs die do you think they try to pull the sled, just the two of them? I think you. I, I bet you this I asshole you, really wants wants those rocks wants bad those rocks, enough. Yeah. That, yeah, the rocks. The rocks are the most important part. Right. So uh, each night's rations were less palatable than the last. Mawson found that quote, "It was worth the while spending some time and boiling the dog's meat thoroughly." Thus, oh. a tasty soup was prepared, as well as a supply of edible meat in which the muscular tissue and the gristle were reduced to the consistency of a jelly. The paws took the longest of all to cook. But treated to the lengthy stewing, they became quite digestible. End quote. Even so, oh, the two men's physical condition rapidly deteriorated. What Mertz, kind of dog soup? I I'm would, sure you could boil it to the point where... How, what do you think dog meat is like? Gamey. It's probably really gamey. Gamey Rob's, is what I would guess. I'm, gonna, gonna I'm about up. to Google what dog meat tastes well, you like. You cook it long enough. I mean, you cook anything long enough, it's gross. But, like, edible. Yeah. Um... Mertz was actually in a really bad condition. Boiling some dogs. So I prefer my dogs grilled. But. Everything grilled. Yeah. Yeah, grilled. Uh, but the problem is Mertz was actually eating the liver more than anything because it was easier to eat. It was, like, more soft to chew through. Mm -hmm. And they think he might have gotten, like, a vitamin A poisoning from okay. that because of all the filtration of the liver. But also, how many dogs do you have to kill to fucking eat? You kill one dog, you should be eating that for... Couple Week. days. Yeah. Well, the, you like, got to Lord, you're not having a fucking like New York strip every night. Like, like I know we we killed fucking uh, Paul's this morning, but yeah, like, I'm really hungry again. <laughs> well, I need another twenty you, hours. Well, you Three p.m., but they, I need another. <laughs> they could carry the. They killed the, the weakest dogs first, so they could carry those for a while. But then, like, they slowly had to start killing more dogs because right. it was a one. They had to slow. They couldn't go at twenty seven hours at a time, and. They were also like well, every dog they kill, they get slower. Well, they get slower, but also it's a real balancing. It's act. a it's a month long trek. It's not like they're they got a week to get back. Right. So they, it, when you think about it, and you're trying to like go that far, you need a lot of energy and fuel. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what the cocaine is for. Well, did, it sounds like they didn't use the cocaine responsibly. They did not use the cocaine the right way. They did no. not use cocaine responsibly. No, I doubt it was enough cocaine to like do anything with. It's probably this enough is pure. This is pure shit. I mean, it's probably in a liquid solution as an eye drop that, you know, they're also... I honestly, I, I imagine him rubbing powder into the man's eyes, he's to just, be quite honest. He's just blowing it up his nose yeah. with a straw. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Mertz was uh, generally in a very bad condition because of this vitamin A, what they think might have been vitamin A poisoning. He had frostbite so bad that the skin was coming off his legs as cool. they were going. Uh, despite his leader's desperation to keep moving, <laughs> Moss was like, we gotta get these rocks back. Your skin be damned. Yeah. <laughs> like, we got to keep this going. to help. Uh, Mertz insisted that a day's rest might revive him, and the pair spent 24 hours huddled in their sleeping bags. You got to think the dogs at this point are like, please stop stopping. Yeah. Every time well, we stop, one of us dies. Well, dude, I mean, honestly, if they can make a tent and them and all the dogs get in there, that's pretty warm. Yeah, for sure. Like, I imagine it was pretty warm, and then they got hungry once they forgot how cold they were. Yeah. Yeah. So the next morning, Mawson awoke to find Mertz delirious. Worse, he had developed diarrhea and fouled himself inside of his sleeping bag. So he did do it in his bag. Oh. Yeah. It took, it took Mawson hours to clean him up and put him back inside the bag to warm him up. So he had to spend about five hours cleaning him off. He had to clean off Ma uh, Mertz because Moss, like, Mawson found him so delirious he didn't know what was going on. Look, I've changed a lot of diapers at this point in my life, and five hours seems excessive. I think it was like five hours to get him out, clean him off, get him wrapped back up, get him settled back down to sleep. Like it was pure. That's just two tops. Yeah, it's it bad just parent. seems like just a towel. Yeah, suffice. Clean towel yourself off. off, you guy that doesn't know what's happening. Honestly, <laughs> just if and if you don't have a towel, skin a dog, wrap him up. 
Well, we you gotta know, wipe them yeah. off and then, yeah. Don't even have to I think you th- you're thinking that, like, they're going through these dogs, like, people that don't know how to eat chicken wings. They're just like, oh, I took a bite of it. It's done. Yeah, I said that's exactly. A lot of meat left on that bone. That's, <laughs> yeah. a, that's exactly how I'm envisioning them going through those dogs. Uh, I, I'm, and uh, th- these people are not Native Americans. They're not using every part of the dog. There's so much dog left over. They're boiling the paws to get enough and, of the and meat. And yet, it still yeah. sounds like they're, they're eating good. dogs like Ross eats chicken wings and <laughs> shrimp. Uh, so our boss, Ross, he told us that in sh- when he eats shrimp, he doesn't actually peel the tail off. He just bites off. And leaves the meat in leaves the tail? Leaves the meat in the tail. That's a lot of meat. It's a yeah. lot of wasted meat. I don't peel the tail off. I just push it out. You just you can, like, just twist it and pull it. You like, do it perfect enough where you just take the bite and it slides out. That too, yeah. Yeah. Don't waste that. So, uh... Eventually, Mertz comes to. They begin moving again, and Mertz drinks some cocoa and beef tea to like try and settle himself down and stay warm. But he begins to go into fits again and falls into a delirium, forcing them to stop and make camp again not too long after they take off. So Mawson writes in his diary, at 8 p.m., he raves and breaks. Oh, I'm sorry, he raves and breaks a tent pole. So he's like angry delirious right. at this point. And he can. Cons- for a rave. <laughs> it's just, Mm-mm. you know, he's Swiss. Mm-mm. He's a Swiss bro. He's got to rave. Got to. It's in yeah. his blood. Uh, he continues to rave for hours. I hold him down. Then he becomes more peaceful, and I put him quietly in his sleeping bag. He dies peace- peacefully at about 2 a.m. in the morning of the 8th. Death due to exposure finally bringing on a fever. Wow, Quote, one less it sounds like he killed him. I me. think he killed him. It's like, dude, you're I shitting think, yourself. You're yeah, breaking the like tent. You're useless. Yeah. It, maybe he's he went into him down. Yeah. yeah. He's got a bag full of rocks he can hit him with. Uh, yeah. More meat. More meat for you. More, More meat. Well, that's true. It's a lot of it. You got to, I guess, cut off the diarrhea parts, but otherwise. Um, so they actually, I forgot to mention this. Mertz and Mawson had a eulogy for Ninnis at the edge of the crevasse. Okay. They read him his burial rites there. Yeah. Um, that glacier is now named after Ninnis. So, uh, and that body's gone. Oh, yeah. That's, you're never finding that body. They didn't even try to well, go down. Well, eventually it'll all melt, and a bunch of uh, human and dog bones will float up to the surface. Yeah, in like 600 years, it'll be yeah. like, oh, well, this no. was a dog park. He yeah. might not even be bone at this point. He might be frozen solid. Mm, right? He could be. We could bring him back. He probably has not decomposed very much, yeah. Yeah. Um, we can we- Walt Disney his ass. <laughs> Which we all know. Or Ted Williams. The movie Frozen was made to throw people off Yeah. the, the SEO, the myth. Get the myth lower on the SEO. Um, but yeah, also, so Mawson buried uh, Mertz at this site, and this would be known as, this is also now known as Mertz Glacier. So okay. there's a Mertz Glacier and a Ninnis Glacier named after both these guys that died. Uh, Mawson was now alone, at least 100 miles from the nearest human being, and in poor physical condition. Uh, his nose and lips began to break open from the wind, and his groin was getting in a painfully raw condition due to reduced uh, circulation, dampness, and friction in walking. See, he wasn't jerking off. See, if he would have jerked off, his crotch wouldn't have hurt so bad. It would have been fine. Yeah, got to stimulate the blood flow. At 9 a.m. on January 11th, so this is um, now a month after they, ha- about a month after they, the first guy goes down the crevasse with the food sledge. Right. Um, the wind finally dies away. Mawson has passed the day since Merce's death productively. Using his now blunt knife, he had cut the one remaining sledge in two, so he cut it in half, and he resewed it. Oh, he resewed his sail, and remarkably, he found the strength to drag Mertz's body out of the tent and entomb it beneath a cairn of ice blocks he hacked out of the ground. Then began to trudge toward the endless horizon, hauling his half sledge. Uh, so I just googled Mertz Glacier on Google Maps, um, and it has one review. <laughs> What's the review? Um, it's five stars. And then the comment says, 10 out of 10, nice glacier. <laughs> Who's the reviewer? Stuart Kartsunis <laughs> from three months ago. He was just there. Uh, I wonder if he found any of our boys. Did, yeah, is there I, a review for Ninnis? Let's glacier? see. Let's see what other reviews he's left. Yeah, he has, uh, <laughs> for Ninnis Glacier, he's another five stars. It says, 10 out of 10, also nice glacier. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is just doing bits that no one is paying attention Only we to. get it. But we, br- we just brought it to the light. What's some of the other stuff he's reviewed? Uh, two restaurants. <laughs> and then uh, the uh, some po- I think a post office or something. Uh, this one got a one star, the post office. 
Australia Post, Lane Cove Post Shop, one star. Postman or woman left the collection slip at the door without ringing the doorbell. I was home and could have accepted the parcel then and there. But he was a big fan of Rose's Canteen. It's an Italian restaurant in Melbourne. And uh, he gave four stars to Cubby's Kitchen in Sydney, CBD. Uh, it's a Lebanese restaurant. It says, everything was amazing, and I would 100% recommend. But don't book at 8 p.m. because the kitchen closes at 9 p.m. And you won't get dessert. Boo. This guy might have actually been at genuinely this, reviewing yeah. the glaciers. He might have went to those glaciers. He's in Australia. It's a nice <laughs> glacier. He's been to Dennis and Merch, gl- Merch <laughs> Glaciers. Hold on. I want to see how far they are from each other. Go on, Al. Yeah, okay. Within a few miles, Mawson's feet became so painful that each step was in agony. When he sat on a sledge and removed his boots and socks to investigate, he found that the skin on the soles of his feet had fallen off, That's leaving funny. nothing but blood and blisters. So he has to smear his feet with wool wax, or uh, there's another name for it. I forget what it's called, but like, it's basically wax made out of the sebaceous glands of wool-producing animals. So like, basically wool pimples it, like wool zits. Okay. Yeah, so he has to... Gross. Cool. Rub that on his feet. He continues. The next day, Mawson's feet were too raw to walk. On January 13th, he marched again, dragging himself toward the glacier he had named for Mertz. And by the end of that day, he could see in the far distance the high uplands of the vast plateau that marked uh, the edge of the base camp. By now, he could cover a little more than five miles a day. Four days later, the very same thing that happened in Ninnis would happen to Mawson. While slowly trudging the Antarctic snowfields, he falls into a crevasse. Sick. So uh, somehow, by probably the only ounce of sheer luck that happened to this guy on the trip, the fissure that opened was a little narrower than his half sledge. So if he would have made it any smaller, that half sledge, he would have fallen and died. Right. So the half sledge is holding him up, and he's harnessed to the sledge. Yeah. So he finds himself dangling about 14 feet down. Is the dog still there? Uh, no, he's, he's manhauling this now. Man hauling the rocks. God, yeah, why? he's bringing the rocks back. Good. Just let go of the rocks, my guy. So yeah. uh, it's, it's like Indiana Jones, where he's like reaching for the grail, like let it go, J- Junior. I can't. I was about to do Connor, but I can't. Junior, let it go, let it go, Junior. So he finds himself dangling about fourteen feet down over what looks like a bottomless pit, and he's spinning slowly on his tra- uh his rope, and the rope is fraying. Mm-hmm. He sees that it's fraying. He uh, makes a great struggle. Mawson inches up the rope hand over hand. Several times he loses his grip and slips back, but the rope holds. Sensing that he had the strength for one final attempt, the explorer clawed his way to the lip of the crevasse, every muscle spasming, his raw fingers slippery with blood. He dragged himself clear. He spent an hour by the edge of the the, uh, crevasse uh, to recover, and he sufficiently... Wow, I really miswrote this. He sufficiently drags open his packs... So he drags them off the, the sledge out yeah. of the fissure. He erects a tent and crawls into his bag to sleep. So he recovers, I guess, at least some rocks. He must have lost a couple, I'm guessing. I assume. Not all the rocks made it, unfortunately. No, unfortunately. That's a sad guy's part. losing things left and right. It's the saddest, saddest part of the story. Heard all day. Yeah. The dogs, part of the conditions of the travel. The friends, the rocks, they know the risk. The rocks had no business getting gone. So that night, lying in a tent, Mawson fashioned a rope ladder, which he anchored to his sledge and attached to his harness. Now, if he were to fall again, getting out of a crevasse should be easier. And uh, the next day, the theory was put to the test because he fell into another crevasse. Uh, this time, the ladder saved him. So from this whole no- fucking continent is just a minefield. Yeah, because crevasses. So like they weren't the the Swiss guy was like, "Hey guys, I think this is bad," and they're all like, "Yeah, huh, we shouldn't be here." Huh? I don't know. Maybe we keep going. There's a reason one of us has been to the South Pole before. There's a reason the animals don't venture inward. No. Like so you don't find anything alive. Also, the- all the water is frozen. Right. Yeah, there's at least water on the outside. Um, so the latter did end up saving him. Toward the end of January, Mawson was reduced to four miles of marching a day. His energy was sapped by the road, or uh, not by the road, by the need to dress and redress his many injuries. His hair began to fall out, and he found himself pinned down by another blizzard. Desperate, he marched eight miles into the gale before struggling to erect his tent. What? Oh, come. Or, <laughs> Thank yeah, you. whatever. The next morning. There's no dogs to fuck. He's fucking the rocks, I guess, <laughs> at this point. Just like rock fucking? Yeah. It's just, it would just be funny if you just need to fuck every day. No matter what. <laughs> just something. Pour a little hole in the ice pack. Yeah. On January 29th, in another storm, he spotted a low, cl- or a low uh, cairn just 300 yards off the path of his march. It proved to mark a note and a store of food left by his worried companions at base camp. 
Emboldened, he pressed on and on February 1st reached the entrance to what was called Aladdin's Cave, where he wept because he had discovered three oranges and a pineapple. Uh, overcome, he later said, by the sight of something that was not white. It was the first shit he had seen in it three months. Snow. That wasn't snow. He's like, oh my God. Ugh. And it was food. Like it was probably true sugary carbohydrates. Right. And not dog meat. As uh, Mostyn rested that night, the weather closed in again. And for five days, he was confined to his ice hole as one of the most vicious blisters he had ever uh, he had ever seen raged over him. Only when the storm stopped on February 8th did he find his way to base at last, just in time, just in time to see the expedition ship Aurora leaving for Australia. So it left? He missed it by hours. It left. <sighs> Brutal. He went uh, essentially 300 miles with a week's worth of food, killing yeah. dogs, losing his two friends. His feet. His, his feet are gone. Like yeah. he, he has no skin on the soles of his feet. He's losing his hair. He can't fucking see pretty much. He's withered. He's, he's a fucking mess. And you just see the boat. Off and, he just, and he gets to the camp and he can see the boat leaving. Like it's not that far away. He can, he then wires them. Yeah. He was like, Hey, come back. And they're like, we can't, we cannot. Like they've tried to turn around. Yeah. They could, the weather was too bad. So we got to go all the way back. Yeah. yeah. So what had happened when they, when the ship came, they bring, I guess, food with them okay. on the return trip to just in case, I don't know, but two people, I guess, stayed with him, mm -hmm. like volunteered to stay with him and they left a bunch of supplies. Okay. He had to wait there another year. Jesus. So we lived in Antarctica. Himself back to hell. Yeah. Basically while the other two people hung out with them. So I couldn't find, I saw this, in a thread where they were talking about it. I couldn't find any, like, I didn't see it on Wikipedia. Maybe I missed it. Like, I didn't see it in any sources. But apparently, this is part of the story. One of the two people that was there, like, taking care of him and watching after him was schizophrenic. Perfect. And slowly losing his mind as well. well. Then he had more people to hang out yeah. with. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a bunch of friends. <laughs> Good one, Dan. That's two for Dan. Actually, three. Three. Yeah. Yeah. Don't count my fucking jokes. You I'm counting them. Schlub. Don't call me that. Anyway, uh, yeah, so that was the guy that also knew how to use the radio. But that's, guy. Yeah, that makes no sense because they eventually did get off the island. They were able to make it. The ship came back and they got All's well that ends well. Uh, yeah, so they had enough supplies, though, there to help them survive yeah. another year and they were able to stay warm. But, yeah, so that's the story of uh, Douglas Mawson, the, probably the toughest nerd on Earth. I guess so. That trek back was pretty hardcore. I mean, he fell into two crevasses and got out. Yeah. He's walking on raw feet. <laughs> Dude, I, I would have been like, I'm dead. Ate multiple dogs. Right. Probably his friend. He probably ate his friend. He ate his friend. He do, we his think friend. He, do we think he at least killed his friend? Cause I think he killed him. Killed him as an inconvenience. He, if he's knocking over the tent in the middle of the night in a blizzard or whatever, yeah, he killed him. You have to. Eventually, you kill him. You're, you're going to get away with it. At a certain point, you're a liability. Yeah. yeah. It's like you. get away with like. Yes. Who's going to bring up, like, oh, murder. Right. Murder charges in Antarctica. No. So what would you, uh, you guys learn? Uh, I don't know. I guess when you visit Antarctica, Antarctica things will happen. Yeah, it sounds like hell. Yeah. That's what I, oh, wow, weird. Is it safe to say that Hitler is Antarctica? No, Hitler's Mawson. Mawson? Mawson is Hitler? Yes. Why? It was his fucking trip. He survived, though. I know. It's kind of unfair. And everyone else didn't. <laughs> yeah. Out of all he the other... He definitely killed a guy. Killed multiple dogs. Here's a... Uh, Eight it, dogs. Mawson actually admits fault in the trip. I did mention... I forgot he to mention this. He goes hand up. He goes, I should have... <laughs> he goes... You're on the basketball court. You, you, you like air I ball touched, I touched yeah. the ball. Like, my bad. I touched my the bad. ball. Yeah. Um, he admitted that he didn't think about bringing snowshoes or skis for the terrain. Oh, for the... Yeah, for um, the winter continent. Yeah. So he's like, they think that the reason Ninnis fell in the first place was because he didn't have adequate foot, like, uh, shoes. Mm -hmm. So when he hopped off the ledge, the rails of the sledge, he put all of the pressure under his feet. It wasn't spread out evenly like right. a snowshoe or a ski would do. Right. So, cause like, I guess, so what I'm guessing is that the guy on the cross country, the cross country skiing guy was on skis. He's like, fuck it. I'm bringing skis. Yeah, probably. And the other two did not Right. So he was able to go ahead and Mawson wasn't on the sledge, so or was on the sledge, so he never got off and put pressure down. And mm. that's why the back sledge fell through the ice hole because Ninnis got off with his feet. Right. That's, so that's probably what happened. And the Huskies weren't heavy enough to do anything about it. Yeah. 
So he admitted, like, yeah, I probably fucking killed him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he's Hitler. Players he's my, fuck up. Yeah. My Hitler. What about the Rocks? Maybe the Rocks are Hitler. Well, no, because the Rocks didn't choose to be on that sled. Or did you? Uh, do you think he fucked up by not going on a uh, Robert? I think it was Robert Cross's expedition that actually did become the first to be the first to reach the magnetic south pole. Yeah, but they died, didn't they? I don't know. They died. There was a guy named a explorer named Robert who his expedition died in Antarctica. Yeah, you think he wants to do like a web redemption? Yeah. <laughs> right. All right, Ma- Douglas, we've strapped you back. Oh my God. Yeah, dude. Yeah, he's my Hitler for being a shitty fucking expedition leader. I mean, it's fair. Yeah. He, he brought he brought his buddy who knew how to handle dogs, and his buddy brought his skiing buddy. Yeah, basically. I mean, he yeah he killed two like no none of them had any business being there. Honestly, he was the leader of the expedition too. It really didn't make sense for him to be the one doing the excursioning. He should have been maintaining the camp. Also, the captain of the ship. <laughs> the guy was like, "We can't make it back." Uh, We're Twenty sorry, feet bro. away, but like, it's yeah, like sorry, I can man. see you. <laughs> Can you imagine? I can see you. Can you just stop for a sec? Like, dude, we Weather's got a window. Bad. We got a window here. I don't know if you remember in the Roanoke thing, too. I think that might have been a Patreon episode. I don't remember. It was. Um, like, they kept trying to save them. It's like, ooh, the weather. Yeah. Sorry. Multiple times. They're just we're like, on the ooh. shoreline, yeah. It's like, no, too stormy. It's a little rainy. See ya. Water's too choppy. We'll try again in five years. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> All right, that's it for me, guys. Uh, be sure to check out softcorehistory.com. We got some brand new merch up. Check it out. Freedom Torch Mugs. Freedom Torch Tees. Go to softcorehistory.com. Check those out. Brand new. Dan, did you design those? I did. They look great. Thank They're you. really good, man. Um, so please check those out. We also have the classics, you know, uh, Two Irish to Die, Mike Malloy tee. We got Topsy the Elephant tank tops. And then we just got, you know, softcore history merch. You yeah. You like the show, buy some of the shirts, rep it. That's honestly, we don't even make that much money off of those. It's more of a marketing expense for us. Yeah, please be our billboard. Please tell people about the show. The designs are good. Put on a tank top. Look hot. Anyway, uh, also be sure to tell your friends about the show. Leave a review, whether that's on Spotify or Apple. Leave five stars. Comment a review as well. And uh, check out our Patreon if you're not listening yet. We come out with an extra episode every week, and it's kind of different content than what we typically do on the the uh, normal weekly cadence. Patreon.com slash Softcore History. Yeah, check that out. It's only $5 to join. You get an extra bonus episode, and it helps support us and what we do here. It really makes a difference in us being able to be more independent Help and us slowly get grow. The grid. Yeah, we want to live in a little tree shack and do our own uh, episodes from there. I'll Simulcast now, from if we space. 10,000 patrons by the end of the year, we'll do a. Uh, expedition episode in antarctica we will go to antarctica we'll find a way if you get us to ten thousand patrons. Fucking do it why not fuck it yeah do it right now and i will carry i, I well i will uh make these two haul in a necessary amount of rocks and i'll make we'll, robbie we'll do the dog it. yeah we'll make robbie the dog it's fine it won't even be hurt we have to make rob just kill a good dog well, no these dogs weren't mostly hurt either <laughs> We just go to Austin Pets Lab. Yeah, we're like, we'll take one, all the dogs. One was just a little gimpy. Well, yeah, I just saw an ad uh, for the shelter saying they were over, you know, capacity. They so. always say that. That's how they get people. But they probably dogs. always are. So yeah. Anyway, check out all that stuff. Leave the reviews, like, and subscribe. Uh, for Dan Regester and Rob Fox, I'm Jake Goldman, and you just got soft served. <laughs>